Thanks so much, Jean, and thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to share some of her work. So I believe I ended up in a diabetes session, not because I work on diabetes, which I don't, but uh, because I was out of town until last night. And uh, I, I think they felt that this was the session that perhaps meshed the most. Um, I was going to be talking about stem cells or cell-based therapies. I'm glad I didn't cover cell-based therapies with diabetes because that was just beautifully uh, presented during the last talk. So I'm going to be switching to a different topic, which is more focused around DNA as a medicine, more so than cells as a medicine. So I'd like to just uh, take a step back and discuss the history in the development of molecular medicines over the past 100 years or so. And of course, the field uh, began with small molecules. This is still largely the staple of the pharmaceutical industry. And this uh, began roughly around two th uh, 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 1908 or 1910 when the first small molecule was rationally synthesized. In that case, it was an antibiotic. Protein therapies were born not long thereafter with the discovery of insulin in 1922 or so. And of course, this has greatly accelerated over the past couple of decades with the, uh, the development of monoclonal antibodies. Gene therapy was originally proposed in 1962, but it really wasn't until the 1980s that some credible levels of gene delivery to particular cells was achieved using some both viral as well as non-viral means. And finally, uh, stem cells were discovered um, in around 1961 and they somewhat rapidly uh, transitioned into therapeutic use in the form of bone marrow transplants, which have blood stem cells as the basis for their success. So in parallel with this therapeutic development, where we have small molecules that uh, bind to and change the activity of proteins, why not deliver the protein itself, the DNA encoding the protein, or the entire human genome? In parallel with this escalation, there's also been a transition in the nature of healthcare problems within our country over the past century. A hundred years ago, the leading causes of death in the U.S. were influenza and tuberculosis. And as a result of antibiotics, vaccination, as well as public health uh, practice improvements, there's been, a, of course, a transition from acute problems of health care towards these long-term chronic age-related illnesses, including neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, as well as cancer. So going back a slide, if we focus on these two therapeutic modalities, DNA, either in the form of a gene, a single gene, or the entire genome, is unique or interesting in that it has the capacity to become a permanent part of an organ or a tissue. So pharmacokinetically, the time scale of potential benefit from these types of molecules or types of uh, therapeutics matches the very, very long time scale associated with the progression of chronic illness. So our group works on these two. I'm not going to be talking about stem cells today. I'll be talking about a different topic from the prior uh, presentation, and namely DNA as a medicine. So gene therapy can, of course, be defined as the delivery of genetic material to a patient's cells for therapeutic benefit. And there's been an old, field in the f uh, old joke within the field over the past 20 years or so that I've been in it, which is that there are only three problems with gene therapy, delivery, delivery, and delivery. And we, of course, know that this word has really been the Achilles heel in the field ever since its inception. So fortunately, over the past 10 years or so, some rather increasingly successful gene delivery vehicles have emerged, typically ones based on a couple of viruses, lentivirus, and really the focus of my talk today, which is going to be adeno-associated virus, which has been enjoying progressively increasing clinical successes over the past decade, which I'll discuss. So a bit of background on this virus, it's among the smallest of all viruses, not just mammalian viruses, both in terms of the genetic information that it contains, it only has around five kilobases worth of information, and furthermore in the physical dimensions of the particles, which are around 26 nanometers in diameter. So the way that it works is that the virus only contains two genes. This first gene, rep, encodes four proteins that mediate the viral replication, or the uh, copying or replication of the DNA. And the second is really going to be the focus of my talk today, are the capsid proteins, these structural proteins, 60 copies of which will oligomerize or self-assemble into this beautiful icosahedron, which contains a hole or a pore at its five-fold axis of symmetry. And the copies of this rep protein will dock at that pore and pump DNA into the interior of the virus to generate an infectious particle. So this is a rather simple virus that only contains a, a simple shell of protein surrounding a chunk of DNA. So it has a number of interesting properties. A number of natural variants uh, on the order of dozens have been isolated from nature. They have some differences in their structure, typically differences in the amino acid content on the surface, which changes a bit their gene delivery properties, their infectious pathways. But they all share one thing in common, which is that uh, they're not pathogenic. They've never been associated with human disease, and that'll become important in a second. 
So the way that you can take this virus and turn it into a Trojan horse to carry in a DNA medicine rather than the own vir virus's own genes is to simply take the two viral genes, cut them out of the genome, and paste them onto a separate piece of DNA, which both renders the particle replication incompetent as well as liberates space for the insertion of, of a gene of interest. Um, furthermore, when you take these three chunks of DNA and put them into a producer cell, no cells will then manufacture or produce this protein shell that's now been loaded with the gene of interest rather than the virus's own genes. So there are a number of properties of this resulting vehicle. One is that it's extremely safe. Greater than 90% of you, probably all of you in the room, have previously been infected with this virus, may even be carrying around latent copies of it, but never even noticed because it's not associated with human disease. Furthermore, it's somewhat efficient as a, uh, these natural versions as a starting point, and it's been utilized in a, a number of clinical trials, approaching 100, for delivery to muscle, liver, lung, brain, and retina. After delivering its DNA to the nucleus of a target cell, it results in very stable, long-term, sustained expression, particularly if the cell is non-dividing, and uh, it's begun to enjoy efficacy in an increasing number of clinical trials. So shown here is uh, just a, a sampling of the trials over the past six years in which it's achieved strong clinical proof of concept and in some cases, dare we say, cures. So here are a couple of trials for a blinding disease called Libra's congenital amaurosis. Um, it's a congenital disease which unfortunately robs uh, young kids of their sight. And furthermore, we're all familiar with hemophilia B. Within this trial, uh, this vehicle, the AAV, was able to convert a severe form of hemophilia within a half dozen patients, although they're um, onto a phase two now, so the number of patients enrolled is increasing. But in this initial report in 2011, they converted around a half dozen patients from severe hemophiliacs to people who had mild or asymptomatic features of the disease. And these efforts culminated in 2012 with the very first market regulatory approval of a gene therapy product outside of China. So this was for a rare disease called lipoprotein lipase deficiency, and it was uh, regula regulatorily, if that's a word, approved in the European Union. So I'm just going to show you a quick example from, uh, from the work of a colleague, Robin Ali, uh, for this disease called LCA2, or Libra's congenital amaurosis type 2. So these uh, young patients were unfortunate enough to have inherited from both mom and dad a defective copy of a particular enzyme that's responsible for recycling photopigment within the eye, the chromophore that um, docks inside of uh, rhodopsin inside of our photoreceptors and is responsible for and necessary for our ability to sense photons. So in the absence of this enzyme, this uh, poor patient here, you can see um, in this behavioral study assessing vision, um, needs a lot of help from the testers. Bumps into the walls multiple times. Uh, takes, I think, on the order of a minute and 15 seconds to be able to make it through this, this very simple maze. So these investigators took the correct copy of the gene, loaded it into the virus, administered it into the retina of these patients, and uh, the uh, results, I think, speak for themselves six months later. So now these trials, and there are four of them, there's a phase three trial now being run at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is probably going to be the very first regulatorily approved gene therapy product in the U.S. when the trial reads out next year. So now um, 30 patients or over 30 patients enrolled in these various trials have experienced multiple order of magnitude, three to four orders of magnitude increases in their visual sensitivity, which, you know, in some ways you could say is a cure for blindness. So the, the hope or the idea now is that the field is really focused on these rare monogenic diseases to gain momentum. Situations where it's quite clear that the disease is caused by defects or loss of function mutations within particular genes that affect particular tissues. And as this momentum begins to accelerate, the technology and the approach becomes de-risked. And then you begin, begin to apply it towards larger disease uh, or patient pools such as these chronic long-term illnesses that I mentioned. And there are gene therapy clinical trials ongoing to use AAV to treat things like Parkinson's or age-related macular degeneration, as well as Alzheimer's. So that is the good news. The not as good news is that while the field is starting to work, many of the disease targets, such as those long-term chronic illnesses I mentioned to you, are much tougher gene delivery problems for a variety of reasons. And these are quite simply beyond the reach or beyond the capabilities of the current delivery technology. So we need better delivery vehicles. So uh, there are a number of problems with a number of these viruses. I'm going to pick on my own for a second. So AAV has problems with pre-existing immunity. I'll describe this again in a second, but essentially you've all been vaccinated against the virus. 
Furthermore, efficiency is good on some cell types, many other cell types, attractive uh, therapeutic targets, AAV is quite poor at mediating delivery to. It has problems with uh, poor biodistribution, getting to the right tissues. Once it arrives at those tissues, it's not very good at penetrating deep into them to transduce a large volume of tissue. Uh, there's zero capacity or capability with the natural versions of this virus to target or address delivery to one cell type but not others. To, uh, and doing that could reduce dosage as well as decrease the chances of off-target effects, side effects. And manufacturing remains a challenge. So all of these considerations arise from a very simple no-brainer statement, which is that nature never evolved viruses for our convenience to use as, as medicines, right? So that means that if we would like to make the properties of these vehicles better, we need to re-engineer them at the molecular level to overcome this list of problems. So one way of looking at that is to simply say that these viruses um, have evolved within a natural setting that's endowed them with a certain set of properties that are successful within nature. So for example, every step right here, every point right here might represent a different sequence of a viral capsid. And likely over 15 million years that these viruses have been evolving, they've achieved some kind of peak in function or success within nature. But once we switch the virus over from a natural setting to a medical setting, we've changed the rules and something that was optimal here may be completely suboptimal there. So evolution was a very powerful tool or algorithm to optimize this function in the first place. So one concept or idea is to continue the process of viral evolution, but simply change the directions, change the reward system, so that we end up creating particles that have exactly the properties that we want them to have for biomedical application, rather than what nature gave them. So this process, uh, using a high-throughput approach that was developed in, in the bioengineering field called directed evolution, is what we've been implementing over the past 15 years to fundamentally change these viruses and engineer, if you will, designer viruses that have precisely the properties that we want them to have for medical application. So we've been doing this for a number of years, as I mentioned, and the way that the approach works is that this protein shell, this capsid that surrounds the virus, is the delivery vehicle. That's what's responsible for escorting the DNA from the point of administration until it arrives in the nucleus of a neuron or an hepatocyte or another target cell. So we take DNA that encodes those capsid proteins and we use a number of natural variants as the starting point. And then we'll mimic the ways in which nature introduces diversity into our own genomes. We use a variety of approaches that achieve recombination and mutation. This creates enormous libraries. We've created something on the order of 100 million variants, each of which may in principle be a solution to the problem we would like to solve. And then we package these into large libraries of particles, each of which is composed of a variant protein shell that surrounds the nucleic acid that encodes that protein shell. So these particles are essentially barcoded with their own genomes. We can then play Darwin and select the fittest from these very large pools. And once we've ended up um, achieving some variants which are more successful, we can use these as the starting points to spin around this loop and gradually climb Mount Everest. And at the end of the day, can pop open the particles, sequence the genome, and recover the information that was responsible for those improvements in function. So we have on the order of 15 papers in which we've done this, um, in which we've used it to address a number of issues associated with adeno-associated virus. I'm just going to show you a, a couple of quick examples today from the nervous system. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about gene delivery within the eye, within the retina. So we're initially implementing this to treat rare monogenic disease within the eye, but with this success, we can then begin to implement it towards things like glaucoma or, or age-related macular degeneration, and the same principles would apply towards other age-related diseases within the central nervous system or elsewhere. So in this case, we don't really know the nature of the problem, but we can evolve a solution to it and be able to move forward with therapeutic development to, at the same time as if we would like to reverse engineer the virus, reverse engineer the solution, and understand mechanistically what was the nature of the problem to begin with. Okay. So a bit of background on the retina. So this is the structure of our eyes. We, can, we have at the back of our retina a number of neuronal layers. There's this initial layer, the retinal ganglion cells, there are a number of interneurons, and at the back of the eye are the photoreceptors, the so-called outer nuclear layer. And then underlying that is a, a layer of cells called retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, these cells break down in, in wet AMD, uh, which results in the growth of blood vessels into the eye and, and progressive blindness. So there are a number of ways, uh, one other structural feature I'll mention is that there's a particularly important region in the back of our eyes called the fovea, which contains a really high concentration of cone photoreceptors. So if you're reading a page and you know how your eye moves back and forth, so that's so you can keep your fovea 
focused in on where you need high acuity vision. So this region right here is responsible for high acuity vision, and the other regions are actually responsible for things like night vision. So another structural feature that's really interesting or important is this barrier right here called an inner limiting membrane. It's an extracellular rich region, extracellular in the matrix rich region rather, that uh, poses a significant barrier to the delivery of drugs or molecules to the back of the eye. So there are a number of ways, including AMD as well as retinitis pigmentosa, in which this can unfortunately happen. The outer nuclear layer of the photoreceptors progressively die, which leads to blindness. So in that trial I mentioned to you earlier, uh, in which investigators used gene therapy to treat Libra's congenital amaurosis, they actually had to do a uh, rather invasive surgery to mediate delivery to those photoreceptors or to the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. Because it turns out that if you stick any natural version of AAV into the middle of the eye, the vitreous of the eye, which is a very quick, non-invasive, 15-minute outpatient procedure with uh, local anesthesia only, the virus doesn't have the ability to penetrate through this couple hundred microns of barriers to be able to make it to the photoreceptors. So to address this issue, the investigators actually stuck a needle all the way through the eye behind the retina and squeeze the liquid between the photoreceptors and the underlying RPE, retinal pigment epithelium. So this has collateral damage, unfortunately. Um, you end up introduce, inducing a transient retinal detachment uh, where the bleb of liquid is introduced. This damages the tissue. It was well tolerated in LCA2 because the eye, it turns out, is not really undergoing anatomical degeneration in that case. But in the majority of diseases, LCAs and retinitis pigmentosas, that's not, not well tolerated. And furthermore, another issue is that if you end up introducing a bleb of liquid, this is a fundus image as if you're looking through a lens at the back of the retina, these blebs of liquid will only end up delivering genes to circles or, or patches of cells that are directly adjacent to where the liquid ends up squeezing uh, behind the photoreceptors. So you're not protecting the entire retina. What you would like to do is to mediate delivery by introducing virus into the vitreous, very non-invasive, very simple by comparison, non-damaging, and furthermore, in principle, has the ability to access the entire eye. So this is a, an ideal way to administer virus to maximize the volume of tissue over which you may end up delivering a, a therapy. So our thought was, can we actually engineer new versions of these viruses, ones that nature has presumably not sampled before because it didn't have a reason to, that do have the ability to spread deep into these tissues and access these difficult to reach cells and, in, and deliver a therapeutic piece of DNA. So there's no cell culture model of the complex anatomy of the retina. So we are actually, or have been conducting this evolution, this engineering um, within, within animal models. So initially in the first work, I'll mention that we're doing some additional work in a minute, we uh, obtained a mouse in which uh, the green fluorescent protein had been genetically knocked into the rhodopsin locus, and as a result, these animals specifically had green fluorescent protein positive photoreceptors. We could then take our entire library, inject it into the vitreous of the eye, wait a certain amount of time, harvest the retinal tissue, put it onto a flow cytometer, isolate the photoreceptors, amplify the virus that made it to the right location, and that would constitute one round of selective pressure or evolution. We then recovered these viruses, repackaged them, administered them to the eye, and repeated this five more times so that we ended up starting with 100 million variants and really narrowed down or focused into just a small handful with one really dominant one. This is what its structure looks like, and it's basically a natural version of the virus, but with seven amino acids diversified on this particularly prominent loop in the surface of the virus that um, is a region that's been associated with the ability of the virus to bind to a target cell. So this is the parent virus. What you're looking at here is a cross-section of the retina. The vitreous is down here, inner limiting membrane, retinal ganglion cells, and the photoreceptors are all the way back here, and this is the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, as I mentioned before, no natural versions of the virus are capable of penetrating back to the photoreceptors, and this is uh, the version that actually only differs from this one by around seven amino acids. So we're hitting every single neuronal population along the way, and as a bonus, we're actually also getting the retinal pigment epithelium. And furthermore, this is a fundus image, and you can see we're also transducing, we're delivering the therapy across the entire back of the retina. So this would provide protection across the full tissue in principle. 
So we then set about to see whether or not we could actually use this to treat animal models of human disease. And one thing we wanted to do, first of all, was to restrict expression just to the photoreceptors, this important target cell type. So using uh, simply swapping out the promoter for a different one, we were able to get uh, very specific transduction or expression in the photoreceptors. So an initial disease target that was of interest to us is a, a rare disease that affects around 1 in 5,000 people, all boys. It's uh, called X-linked retinoschisis. It's caused by loss of function mutations within a gene called retinoschisin that encodes a protein that serves as a, an extracellular um, matrix protein, an adhesion protein. So in its, and this protein is secreted from photoreceptors. In its absence, the, the eye or the retina begins to lose this, this glue, this matrix protein, and begins to delaminate and form cavities. So this is uh, an optical coherence tomography, an OCT image from an 11-year-old boy. And this uh, loss in the structure of the retina is accompanied by loss in vision. Uh, a number of prior studies have tried to express this protein from that very first layer of neurons, that retinal ganglion cell layer, and it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't rescue the disease. And you might imagine that the other option, which is to put a needle through this retina and deliver liquid back here, would in this case stretch the retina and tear it apart. So we then began to uh, deliver this, this virus or this therapeutic protein within a mouse model of this disease. This is an OCT image of a wild-type mouse. This is the retinoschisin mouse, where you see these cavities forming. And any combination of the wrong vector or the wrong transgene, so this is our version of the virus delivering an inert gene. We also tried delivering the therapeutic protein using any number of natural versions of the virus, all result resulted in this. And only when we delivered this uh, correct copy of the protein or the, or the uh, DNA encoding the protein within our engineered version were we able to structurally rescue the retina. And that can be seen by quantifying the thickness of the retina, or specifically the outer nuclear layer, where the delivery of this correct gene rescues the thickness of the, re of the uh, retina. Okay, so this is structure. What about function within the retina? So this is uh, electrophysiology, analysis of the ability of the eye to respond to light. So this is uh, an e-phys uh, person's view of vision. So this dotted line is the wild type response. This initial dip is the function of the photoreceptors. The second peak is the function of inner neurons processing the information from the photoreceptors. And as you can see that uh, in the case of the diseased animal receiving a control, there's a, a flat line. These animals have, have lost vision. If we deliver the correct version of this protein using the engineered virus, we're able to not quite all the way back up to wild type, but largely restore uh, vision to these animals. And furthermore, that effect uh, where this axis is essentially the difference between here and here, it's the magnitude of that EFIS response. Um, this response is sustained through half the life of the animal. We took this out to six months and then at that point stopped to do histology and compare it to any number of negative controls. We then extended this to the uh, disease that's currently being treated within the clinic, which is Leber's congenital amaurosis. This is the RD12 animal, which is lacking any immune reactivity for RPE65. If we deliver GFP, nothing happens. If we use any number of natural versions of the virus to deliver RPE65, nothing happens. And if we use our engineered version, we're able to largely restore expression of this protein, which results in long-term electrophysiological or functional uh, improvement as well. Okay, so an important step towards clinical translation, of course, is to move towards larger animal models. And mice are mice, humans are primates, and there are differences in the structure between, uh, in the retina between lower animals, rodents, versus human beings. So specifically, we have a fovea, as I described earlier. Mice don't have one of those. And furthermore, this inner limiting membrane is actually thicker for non-human primates as well as human primates compared to the rodent. So this is a, a tougher gene delivery challenge. So we, uh, I'm gonna show you real quick some data, but I'll explain it really quick. What happens is if you analyze this fovea, the inner limiting membrane is really thick across most of the retina, begins to thin out right on top of this fovea, exposes superficially these retinal ganglion cells and the photoreceptors, the cone photoreceptors, which are a very important target, again, responsible for high acuity vision, uh, lie in the middle of this patch all the way at the bottom. So we um, delivered using a number of different uh, natural versions of virus, um, a reporter gene, in this case we're using Cinemolgus macaques, and regardless of which version we took a look at, we got the same expression pattern, which we call the ring around the fovea. So this initial superficial layer of retinal ganglion cell gets uh, transduced right here, 
These project into the optic nerve head. It's these cells that actually project into the brain, make up the optic nerve, and send the information from the eye into the visual cortex. But unfortunately, we're not hitting any photoreceptors, and we're not hitting the cones in the middle of these loops across the entire retina. Okay, so what about our version that we optimized or engineered in a rodent? So this is what it looks like. We're expressing, uh, in this case, transgene within a number of puncta outside the fovea. We're not being able to make it through the inner limiting membrane across the entire retina. But importantly, in the middle of the fovea, we appear to have expression within the photoreceptors. And that can be confirmed by actually sectioning through any of these regions where we see transgene expression. So if we do that, this is a, a natural version of the virus. There's some expression in that first layer of neurons. And up here, uh, this is occurring because retinal pigment epithelia have some pigment which autofluoresces. And we actually had to turn up the gain on the camera dramatically to be able to even see this fluorescence. And then you start seeing the autofluorescence within the RPE. If we analyze uh, our engineered version, in this case, we actually turned down the gain on the camera so that we could compare it to this initially. We see expression within photoreceptors. But if we use the same camera gain settings on both of those, you can see that we have dramatically higher gene expression levels in, in the case of our engineered version. So where this currently stands is that uh, this is uh, entered into clinical development uh, to be able to treat, uh, it turns out, wet AMD. And furthermore, we believe this is okay but not great. We would like to really protect more of the retina. So by doing the engineering within the rodent model, we're able to treat rodent models of human disease. If we truly want to treat human disease, we need to do the engineering within a large animal model. So we're actually doing evolution now within several large animal models and uh, have some initial results uh, that look promising. So I'd like to uh, close by saying that uh, we view viruses in some ways as gifts of nature. They've been evolving for millions of years to deliver their own DNA, and if you pick the right virus, one that's inert, you can then begin to harness it to, and trick it into delivering a therapeutic piece of DNA instead. However, uh, these viruses are fundamentally mismatched with the needs of medicine because they evolved for one purpose and we're asking them to do something that's different. However, evolution is a powerful tool to create new biological function and we've been directing the evolution of these viruses to create brand new designer viruses that now have the properties that we would like them to have even if the mechanistic knowledge that underlies the initial problem is not known to us at the beginning. So we have used this to fundamentally change the properties of viruses almost at will, including altering receptor binding specificity, increasing efficiency both in culture as well as in vivo, targeting virus towards specific cell types, both in culture as well as within animals, enhancing immune evasion and improving, it turns out, the integration of viral genomes into the, uh, uh, into the cellular genome in work I didn't describe today. And finally, once you've evolved a solution to the problem, reverse engineering it for scientific motivation has led us to discover some interesting mechanistic insights into virus-host relationships. I'd like to uh, close by uh, acknowledging the people who actually did the work. Uh, so this was uh, conducted by Ryan Klimshak and Denise Dalkara, and more recently by Leah Byrne, a postdoc within our lab, in uh, collaboration with John Flannery at UC Berkeley, as well as Bill Merrigan, uh, who's our collaborator with the uh, non-human primate work. Thanks so much, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you.